across a single neuron. And a key thing we can look for here is that these same neurons can be repurposed for other things as well, like representing the concept of your cat. <coughs> so, in general, in, in neuroscience, I suppose, people would like to measure for whether these, you know, which types of representational strategies are, are used in the brain. And this is, in general, quite a hard thing to measure because it's difficult to stick, you know, needles in humans and take lots of data and so on. But you and I are very lucky because we work on these types of networks and we can basically measure anything we want. So shouldn't we be able to look for these types of representations in the networks we study? So before I go further, uh, many of you may be thinking, you know, isn't this actually already resolved? There was this great paper by Christian Chegedy et al. in 2013, and they showed some evidence that, you know, uh, representations are distributed, it's just a big tangled mess, and you can't really do anything else about it. Uh, well, for various reasons we can talk about at the poster session, uh, we think this is kind of an incomplete story. Uh, we, we do think some representations are at least partially distributed, but uh, they actually showed this result only for the second last layer in the network, not everywhere in the network, and there's a little more subtlety going on there that we can talk about later. Also, uh, in work with some of my collaborators, we showed that uh, in the middle of some networks, you see kind of uniquely or globally represented concepts like spiders and uh, detectors for water and detectors for text which seem to be fairly more locally representational. So, let's imagine you buy, buy my argument for now that something more subtle might be going on. Uh, we have our neural network here on the right, and we'd like to test for the presence or absence of these different types of representational codes. So how might we actually go about doing that? Uh, one method you can imagine is we assemble a list of distinct concepts we'd like to test for, so grandmother and cat and stop sign and lawnmower and so on. And then we assemble kind of a labeled training set corresponding maybe images with each of these labels, we push all the images through the network, we see if there's a neuron that always fires your grandmother and never for anything else and so on, and that would kind of sort of work. We could test for the local hypothesis this way. Unfortunately, this method would require lots and lots of concept labels, so a larger label data set than we actually have. Um, it would be a bit of a Herculean effort to collect this entire human annotated data set. However, actually, if you were here at ICLE last year, uh, Ole Zhao took a step up to the mic, I don't know. He took a stab at being Hercules and actually had a bunch of mechanical turkers label individual units in a neural network. And he found actually some local concepts like uh, lamps and table legs represented halfway through a network. In general, this, this paper was, was quite amazing. Um, however, it's not necessarily going to scale to large, more and more concepts because you need to pay lots of turkers. Also, there's actually a more subtle issue going on, which is this approach tends to work for when your concepts have labels that are recognizable to a human. So, for example, grandmother, cat, stop sign, and so on are all concepts that you might find in a dictionary. They're things that humans found so important that we wrote them down. Uh, but maybe there are other concepts that are equally important that we haven't given words to. So, basically, what, what, what counts as a concept? Is it just words in the dictionary or something else? For example, maybe some neuron in your brain or in an artificial neural network would respond to uh, the reflection of the sun off of the water. So is this an important concept or not? Also, maybe the particular tufts of hair on behind dog's ears that can be used to tell Yorkshire Terriers from Norwich Terriers. It's probably not a concept that matters to any of you unless you are dog breeders or you've been working on ImageNet for way, way too long. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what we don't want to do is we don't want to bias our search for concepts toward what humans would label as concepts. We want to look for kind of a more general approach. Uh, so in this study, we're going to make this key definition and assumption that kind of addresses the first concern and answers the second question all at once. And we can argue about whether this is a good assumption or not, but we're just going to make it. So we're going to make the assumption that <coughs> concepts are just feature subspaces that are reliably learned in multiple networks. So to give this more concretely, uh, if many humans end up learning somewhere in the brain a detector for cats, that means cats are a concept that's worth considering as like a, a unique concept that stands on its own, I guess. If many ANNs learn a feature for the sun reflecting off of water, then that also is a concept that deserves to be given kind of, uh, first citizenship status. And also, we should note that these concepts can be multidimensional. So if all of us learn uh, to span the space of colors, then color is a concept that's worth considering as a concept, whether we actually span it using RGB or HSB. Still, it's, it's now like a three-dimensional concept that we can, should consider as a first-class citizen. So this definition and assumption uh, leads us sort of directly to our key technique in this study, which is that we can probe for different types of representation, local or distributed, <coughs> by comparing multiple networks trained starting from different random initializations. So for example, if we train multiple networks from different random initializations, uh, and a local code is being used, we would expect to find uh, features in one network 
that are relearned by the second network, but may be subject to a position permutation. On the other hand, in the completely distributed case, we may find that units are only used as sort of arbitrary basis vectors to span the entire representation space. And the basis vectors in one network may be kind of a rotated version of the basis vectors in another network. Uh, we also admit a sort of intermediate hypothesis called the uh, partially distributed hypothesis. In this case, we expect to see low-dimensional subspaces that are reliably learned in multiple networks, but where within that subspace, the basis vectors in one may be a rotation of the basis vectors in another. So to show this in a slightly different way, in the local case, we expect the basis vectors for one network to be almost perfectly aligned with the vectors in another network. In the partially distributed case, we expect rotations through low-dimensional subspaces for one network versus the other. For example, maybe in only two out of the three dimensions here. And in the fully distributed case, we expect kind of arbitrary rotations through all feature dimensions. In this study, we use uh, the AlexNet architecture trained on HDET. Uh, the architecture is identical, just the initializations are different. Uh, if you're curious, the performance of both networks is very, very similar. So, let's start by probing for the presence or absence of this local code. To do this, first we'll see if we can find units that match well one-to-one uh, -one between the two networks. <laughs> to find matching units one-to-one, -one, what we do is we push all of ImageNet through the networks, and we compute correlation statistics between neuron activations in one network versus the other. Just to be clear, we only ever compare neurons uh, on the same layer from one network to another, never across different layers of the networks. So first, just to start with, let's compute the correlation of all units in uh, net1 with itself on some layer, here conv1. So if we visualize this as a matrix and we take the absolute value, we see correlation values at max of 1 along the diagonal, so this white diagonal is correlation values of 1 with a unit you know, with itself, of course they should be 1. Everywhere else you see values that are generally quite small because features are generally fairly orthogonal, although you see some bright spots where you know, multiple features kind of overlap in their representation somehow. Uh, for network two, we see a very similar, very similar picture. And then finally, what we're interested in is this matrix, so it's the uh, between net or cross net correlation between net one and net two. So as a brief aside, you might be wondering, you know, correlation is a very simple measure. Is that actually powerful enough to identify the type of correspondences we'd like to. We also wonder this. So in addition to trying correlation, uh, we have a whole section of the paper where we try mutual information. We estimate it by using some histograms. And the short version of the story is it's all the same. Uh, you can check out the supplementary information for more about that. OK, so back to our matrix. We have this uh, between that correlation matrix, net 1 to net 2 for comp 1. And what we're interested in seeing in this matrix are these, these bright areas. So these bright pixels are entries where a ne neuron in net 1 and the Another neuron in net 2 are kind of firing all the time for the same thing. So to find the actual matches between one network and the other, we can take a couple of approaches. So a straightforward approach is to use what we call greedy matching, where we simply pick a max along each row. So for each neuron in one network, find the most predictive or most correlated unit in the other network. We can uh, pick the max along each row and kind of visualize these matches in the following way. So for each neuron in any, any network, we visualize it like this. We show on the top the top nine patches that cause high activation for this unit, and we show the deconvolution of those top nine patches uh, from Zyther and Fergus 2014. So here's a network, uh, sorry, here's a unit in the first network, and its corresponding unit in the second network. Here we see both networks learn units that uh, correlate with a value of one, indicating that they learn kind of very much the same concept, the same kind of green detector, suggesting that maybe this color space is not just spanned by arbitrary vectors, but maybe this this single dimension is very important. Um, it also could have been that it's spanned by different vectors and you just got really lucky that they correlated so perfectly. Uh, you know, they both happen to span in the same way, but they didn't need to span in the same way. If we look for other matches, we can find others. So for example here, uh, here's two horizontal edge detectors which are very highly correlated. And if we keep looking, we can find others that are you know, less and less correlated, uh, detecting other types of features. Eventually, if we continue the process for all units in COD1, we can see that there are some units here on the right, they have no great match. For example, some of those units on the far right, uh, the best match unit in the second network has a correlation only like 0.2 or 0.3 with the unit in the first network. This suggests that these features are kind of unique. They were learned once, but not the second time. We can follow the same process for COM2, uh, finding eventually highly correlated units that are recognizing speckle textures, grids, and green objects, and so on. Uh, repeat the process for COM3. Actually, in COM3, we see something really cool. I think it's really cool. So here's a here's a local code on the left here. It's a single neuron that learns to represent the concept of black and white objects. And it's learned in both networks, and it's very highly correlated. So this to me means like 
this concept, even though you might not have thought of enumerating this concept initially when we were starting the study, it means this concept is actually present in the network. It's actually learned reliably. So maybe it deserves to be considered as like a first class concept that has local representation. And if you check out the paper, you can see other, other concepts along this road. So back to our matrix here. What I just showed you was the greedy matching approach where we pick the max along each row. Um, this is done with replacement, so multiple units in net one could be paired with the same unit in net two. We don't necessarily have to do it this way. Alternately, we can find the best match without replacement, uh, so that every unit in one network has a sort of unique counterpart in the other network. We can do this by finding the max weighted bipartite matching. So this matching allows us to take two networks here with units that are not quite aligned and to bring them into the best possible alignment. If we visualize the correlation matrix between the approximately aligned networks, it looks something like this. Uh, so this shows this shows along the diagonal, you can see some uh, relatively bright diagonals showing uh, the cases where the max uh, weighted by project matching was kind of successful in finding a great pair. Other parts of the diagonal are not so bright, showing that those units you know, did not find a good partner. Uh, in some cases, the match is found in both methods are the same. In other cases, the match is found in different, and we can actually gain additional insight by comparing the ones that are the same with the ones that are different. We do this um, by plotting each unit along the x-axis, <laughs> with the correlation of its match along the y-axis. Here, the correlation of the max match is shown in light green, which is always higher than the correlation, or at least as high, as the correlation shown by the uh, max weighted by part type match. Uh, we sort the units on the x-axis by their correlation value simply for clarity. So there's a couple observations we can draw from this. First, if we look at these high correlation pairs in the beginning, there are matches found by both methods that, that co coincide, and they happen to have fairly high correlation. If we think back to our local distributed thought experiment, this is what we would expect to see in the cases where local code is being used. Uh, we can also find some units in that one without high correlation match in that two, indicating that these features are, like we said, unique to one network or the other. Uh, this could be, we're not actually sure what the timing of this means, it could be that the features are just learned here and they're completely missed by the second network, which would suggest one possible reason why ensemble methods might be effective. Uh, finally, we see this kind of interesting middle region um, where, in some cases, the matches are not the same between one, one method and the other. So, in some of these cases where they differ, the bipartite matching is much worse. So, if you look at this, uh, this huge spike in the middle, uh, what, do you, what do you think is going on there? So, let's imagine for a second that the partially distributed hypothesis is true. If it was, what would we expect to see? So we might, for example, see net one learn to span a subspace of, say, human faces using four units, but net two learns to span the same subspace with only three units. So if we use green matching, we might find these pairings. With unique bipartite matching, on the other hand, three of the four units from net one might be matched up to their nearest counterpart <coughs> net two, as shown. But then the fourth unit, although it has a relatively high correlation counterpart in net two, those three units are already taken, and it ends up being paired with an almost unrelated filter here. So, we don't take this to be proof positive of a partially distributed hypothesis, but we take it to be a hint that such a code might be being used. Um, in the paper, if you check it out, you can see similar plots for the first five, first five workers. Okay, so, so far, uh, I've shown you uh, <coughs> a certain way of looking for possible one-to-one -one matchings, and we found that there are some. And that explains kind of some of the representations, but not everything. So there's a whole lot of the rest of the network that's not well explained by this one hypothesis. So what we'd like to do next, and I'll have to go kind of quickly through this, is uh, find kind of, so take those locally represented things and kind of chop them off, and then try to find if we can, see if we can find low dimensional subspaces where it's not a single dimension that predicts a single other dimension here, but it's kind of like a, a few dimensions here that predicts a few dimensions here. So, again, skipping some details for time, but we basically learn mapping layers from one network to another, so we predict one network's activations from the other. Uh, we do this using, first, a dense weight matrix, which works fairly well. Then we kind of have this knob where we have an L1 sparsity penalty, and we slowly turn that up. And we find that as we turn it up, we can actually get very sparse solutions without suffering a loss of performance, indicating that actually you don't need the full dimension to predict one network to another. You can actually use a very small subset. For con one, it's generally four or five units to predict one of the units accurately. Eventually, if you make it too sparse, prediction fails. For con two, we see similar results. For con three, four, and five, the picture is a little trickier, and I refer you to the paper for that. Uh, so, in the interest, okay, so here's, a, here's an example mapping matrix from one layer to 
from one network to another. You can see it's much sparser than our correlation matrix we found before. Uh, but the prediction is still just about as good. So if we take a few slices to this matrix, we can see some interesting stuff going on, for example. Uh, here's a one unit in net two that's predicted very well using only the activations of three units in net one. Uh, here's another, another slice through that matrix. Okay, so this is the few to one mapping, but this still isn't the full partially distributed hypothesis where we have you know, several to several mappings. So to find that, it's even harder and we don't have a super great method yet. Uh, we are using something called hierarchical agglomerative clustering for now. This produces kind of a tree structure which we can then use to create units in both networks to kind of align them with this tree. The tree is generated such that uh, co-predictive clusters end up together. If we zoom into some of these co-predictive clusters, we can eventually see, uh, for example, here is a four-dimensional subspace of edge filters where the subspace in one network predicts the subspace in another. Here's a four-dimensional subspace of uh, colored edge filters, and so on. This is very much not quite a complete story yet, but it's a kind of first step toward finding these low-dimensional subspaces. Uh, to kind of wrap up quickly, uh, sometimes we find some local codes are being used, like that black and white neuron. Other times we have some evidence, uh, some preliminary hints, let's say, of a partially distributed hypothesis being true, based on some layers, and we definitely don't understand some parts of what's going on. So, to summarize a different way, I think this is actually a pretty interesting research trajectory. Uh, it'd be really cool to see anyone work on this. This paper is really just the first like, small step along this direction of you know, training many networks, comparing between them, and seeing what that can teach us about the representations that are used. Uh, we'd like to better understand the partially distributed case in the future, if we could. Uh, we'd like to obviously ask, you know, how does this vary with architecture? So do different types of architectures use fundamentally different representations, and is that good or bad? And if that's good, then you know, should we encourage certain types of representations by, for example, having limited, limited connectivity or other penalties during training? Uh, before I end, in one minute, I just want to give a completely shameless plug. So uh, I'm now working at this company called Geometric Intelligence with Gary Marcus and Zubin. Uh, we're really small, we're getting off the ground now. If you're interested in maybe joining a very small group of researchers uh, doing some machine learning work, where your work would have a fairly large impact, uh, talk to me afterwards. Uh, if you're interested in our code, it's uh, all online here on each friend's website. You can email any of us with questions. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to my co-authors, and uh, thanks to you guys for listening. So what, it, what at least people in the 80s uh, use this term for is when uh, the, the units are actually activated by many different patterns. Right? So your black and white detector is activated by many, many different patterns, not just like random right cell. Right? And uh, everything you're shown here is maybe that uh, like full distributed doesn't mean that uh, uh, even how distributed or is distributed. Right? So, if, if a particular input is represented by any subset of features, then it's distributed. Even sparse coding is distributed, right? Well, so, okay, how, how would you, what's the difference between a grandmother neuron and the black and white neuron that I showed? The difference is that uh, that neuron is activated for a huge variety of different inputs, whereas the grandmother neuron is only activated by uh, a particular image, which is the image of your grandmother. Maybe, but I would say they both represent a single concept. Yeah, but that's, not the, way that but that's not the meaning of the distributed. The okay. meaning of the distributed is that a given sensory input uh, is represented by the activation of multiple attributes corresponding to different neurons. Okay, I, I think I it's just, personally It's just terminology, have, right? I mean, yeah, I don't know the correct terminology to use, and maybe we should call it something different than local. Um, I would say you can imagine that you never have a neuron that specifically fires for black and white stuff. Instead, you only have red, green, blue, and the surface of black and white objects is just kind of a particular sphere in that space, right? But we don't find that, right? We find a specific of course, neurons, unit. Neurons, the only thing you're saying is that neurons specialize to particular, you know, type in a uh, subspace or, or, or region in input space, and of course they do. But that's different from the concept of um, uh, local versus distributed. Okay, maybe we can find a better name for this, or maybe many smart people have already invented that. Okay, uh, I think we're going to have to move on now, sorry. So, uh, <laughs>
figure it out. Okay. okay.